and I got to click. Okay. Got the button clicked. All right. So uh, we're going to try and talk about Newton's laws of motion. Whoops, let me get me up there. There we go. All right. So some of you have uh, some knowledge of this already, probably most of you from high school physics or from physics 110. Uh, we've got three laws. And it, uh, if you want, again, they're on page, uh, oh, the Newton's laws are on page 84. So uh, two of them anyways. So let's, um, let's start with a screen share of that. <clears throat> okay, that's this one. We'll do control F. Or actually, we'll just go up here. There we go. All right, so Newton's first law and Newton's second law here, and then we'll talk about Newton's third law in just a second. So um, an object in motion stays in motion unless, that's a key word, unless uh, it's acted upon, acted on by an, a non-zero net external force. So basically, uh, an object in motion stays in motion unless you've got some weird force on it. Similarly, an object at rest stays at rest unless you've got a weird force on it. Now, what does that mean? All right, to be clear, an object moves with constant velocity if there's non-zero net force. One possible constant velocity would be zero, right? So if it's at rest, that's constant velocity of zero. And if it's in motion, it's gonna stay in motion in the same direction unless you exert a force on it. So I like to think about, say, like a plane flying, okay? As it's flying through the air, okay? This is a very rough model of a plane, all right? So imagine we have a plane here. All right, so some kind of rocket thruster here. Probably some little... Okay, so let's say we have a plane. <clears throat> all right, oh, we've got some glare too. Get rid of that. All right. Uh, there we go. So you have this plane. Obviously, there's some force forwards on this plane. We could call that capital T for thrust. Okay. There's its weight pulling it down. I'll call that lowercase w, or sometimes we'll call that mg. So there's a force pulling it down. There's lift, right? And so Maybe we could just call that uh, L for right now, for lift. All right. And then there's atmospheric drag going this way. Now, at this point, if for some reason all four of these forces on the plane balance, it's going to continue flying at the same rate in the same direction. All right. So that's the same velocity. That means there's no acceleration. Obviously, if these forces aren't perfectly balanced, let's say the lift is larger than the weight, it's going to go up. Or what if the thrust is larger than the drag, it's going to speed up. Or similarly, what if the thrust is smaller than the drag, it's going to slow down, or, or it could go up or down, left, right, and it could go at angles, depending on the combination of these, right? So uh, this is, I think, a really good example to get a feeling for it. If you have a plane flying at constant velocity, same speed and same direction, then the forces balance. That's called dynamic equilibrium. There's another case people like to think about. We have a block sitting on a table, not going anywhere. And in this case, there would be a normal force up and there'd be MG down. And we could talk about these symbols and what I'm gonna use for symbols in just a minute. But in this case, if these two forces balance, this thing is staying at rest. So this would be a static equilibrium. Okay, so there's two types of equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is where you're moving with constant velocity, constant speed and direction. That's, you're still in equilibrium. That's called dynamic equilibrium. And there's static equilibrium where you're not only have zero acceleration, you also have zero velocity. But to be clear, equilibrium is a physics term. Equilibrium implies 
acceleration is zero, but it does not imply velocity is zero. That's one of the things I want, right? A lot of people confuse equilibrium with this problem. This is one possible equilibrium state where velocity happens to also be zero, okay? So just be aware, equilibrium, no force. That means acceleration is zero, but not necessarily velocity, okay? That's a very common uh, misconception when people are starting, okay? So, whoops, let me get back to here. So if you've got your book, you might want to watch out, okay? To be clear, if the net force is zero, this seem, that means the sum of forces is zero on an object, then acceleration is zero. You could still be moving with constant velocity. All right. Well, taking this further, if we want to know an object's acceleration, all we have to do is find the net force on that object and divide by its mass. And I think this makes some sense, right? If objects have more mass, generally speaking, they tend to have small accelerations. For example, a hummingbird that flies around or, or a mosquito or a fly, right? They're very hard to, uh, to follow because they have such rapid accelerations because they're very low mass. Whereas if you applied the same forces to a human being or a train, right? The accelerations would be tiny. Or when you push on the planet with your feet, right? You exert forces on the planet when you jump on it, but we don't notice the planet accelerating because the planet's mass is so large. So that's Newton's second law. Now, I'll be clear here. The reason these two are grouped, I just want to point out, Newton's second law essentially includes Newton's first law. Look at those equations. If acceleration is zero, we expect the net force is zero. That's right here. So a lot of times we kind of use Newton's second law for everything, whether it's in equilibrium or not. And that's just kind of a practical thing. And then, all right, so that's page 84. Um, now, um, one other thing here. Mass and inertia are essentially synonymous terms for, for us, okay? For all intents and purposes, you could use the words mass and inertia interchangeably. Now let's think about this. The more mass you have, right? The more mass you have, the smaller your accelerations are. Think about it this way. If you have a large mass or a large amount of inertia, you resist changes in velocity, okay? Obviously, an object with a large mass, such as a jet plane, could have tremendous velocity. But if it's very massive, it resists changes in that velocity, all right? So trains, right? They're hard to get started and they're hard to stop. Cars, hard to get started, hard to stop, okay? So the smaller you are, the easier it is to change your velocity. Again, going back to an insect, it has a trivial amount of mass, so it's very easy for insects to change their velocity and rapidly change direction. They have low inertia, all right? Now, I think, um, whoop, oh, whoops, sorry. Um, well, let's just check before we go on. Uh, let me go to gallery view. Any questions on that right now? Concepts or otherwise? Kind of some basic stuff. All right, let's look at Newton's third law while we're here. And again, you can unmute at any time or throw a question in the chat. Let's see, where's Newton's third law here? I think it's the next page. Oops, one more, sorry. Newton's third law. So I like to break out Newton's third law into its own section here because students screw up Newton's third law all the time. This is the most common mistake uh, that people make regarding Newton's laws. People think Newton's third law means something different than it does. There's a simple trick to get this down and never screw it up again. So I'm gonna show you that. The force that object one exerts on object two is equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction to the force that two exerts on one. There is no shorter way to say that. Now, I want you to look carefully at this second line right here. Okay, notice this first one includes vectors. If you include the vectors, you have to include the minus sign. 
if you do not include the vector symbol, we're talking about magnitudes. So notice the force that one exerts on two in magnitude is equal to the force two exerts on one in magnitude. So their magnitudes are equal. This is the direction part. So I'm gonna clear that ink just so you can see a little bit better. So just kind of confirm you understand that sentence carefully. All right. Now, um, all right, just giving you a second to digest there. Let's take a look at this. All right, here's a simple case, right? This is uh, this object here. I'll turn it so you can see it a little bit. This is the whiteboard. Here's me. If I push on the whiteboard, now I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit, right? I weigh a lot more than this whiteboard. So when I push on this, but it does actually have an effect. I do kind of find myself falling backwards. So if I put my feet close together here and I push on this, right? I go back a little bit. The whiteboard goes back a lot. This relates to Newton's second law as well. Who is pushing harder on who? Am I pushing more on the whiteboard or is the whiteboard pushing more on me? What do you think? Unmute. They're equal. The same. The issue is we have different accelerations. Let me show you. All right. The idea here is, let's say I have a big blob. That blob is named Rob. And then you have a small blob. And that small blob is called WB for whiteboard, all right? Now, what happens here is I pushed on the whiteboard. So I'll call this the force of one on two, all right? Notice this is a magnitude. This is the direction. Well, this is the way object two pushes on one. And notice if I drew this correctly, they should be the same size. So it looks like this one could be just a little bit longer. We'll go there. The idea here is we exert the same amount of force on each other in opposite directions because we are touching each other. Now, what happens here is the acceleration of number one. And so just to be clear, I'll label this number one and this number two, right? The acceleration of number one vector is equal to, let's assume that we're deep in space and these are the only two forces. We don't have to worry about up and down. Or if you want to think about this, right? I know that the upward force on me from the ground is balanced by my weight. So those forces end up canceling out. Similarly for the whiteboard, the up and down forces cancel. So it's okay to view this as just side to side. We could say there's force two on one in the negative I hat direction all over the mass of Rob. Whereas the acceleration of two would equal, uh, there's a little glare there. The acceleration of two would be the same size force, one on two, in the positive I hat, divided by the mass of the whiteboard. All right, and so again, there's still a little glare there. Uh, let's just try and turn this a little bit. Uh, I'm just getting, oh, that's from this, that's from this one here. All right, whatever. there. All right. So in this case, think about this. If my mass is huge and this mass is relatively small, it makes sense that my acceleration is a lot smaller than the whiteboards. And so we confuse this as human beings. We tend to think, oh, well, if you're accelerating less, you must have less force on you. That's not necessarily true. Okay, here we see a case where there's the same amount of force, opposite directions, and then the resulting accelerations differ. But that has nothing to do with the size of the force, right? It, right? That's, we're exerting exactly the same force, and because this one is so much bigger, it, we observe less of an effect from that force. We observe less acceleration. So if you could kind of Force yourself to truly believe Newton's laws, especially Newton's third law and Newton's second law. The combination will usually explain a tremendous amount of phenomenon. Think about this. When you uh, punch a wall because you're frustrated about how much physics homework you have to do, the wall doesn't move much and your hand gets destroyed. 
And that's because the wall is a lot more massive than your hand. And so it, your hand will experience a much larger acceleration in the negative direction and it will break your bones. So don't go around punching the wall when you're upset about physics. Just get to work earlier next time. All right. Um, questions about that. Let's go to a quick gallery view. Any questions? Where'd my water go? I lost my water. All right. So far, so good. And again, you could ask questions at any time today. I'm just trying to get us rolling. I'm going to go back to page 83 for reasons that will uh, become obvious in a second. Let's see here. Whoops, is this it? Oh, one more page. Sorry. Sorry about that. I guess if I was smart, I would have used this uh, page number up here. So... The point of 80, page 83, if you've got it open your workbook, is just to give you an idea of the symbols I'm going to use all the time, all right? So when I say normal force, I'm going to say just lowercase n. A lot of times, textbooks will also use capital F, subscript n. That's totally valid as well, okay? But for me, it makes it a lot faster for me to write the book if I just use lowercase n for normal force, right? To be clear, look at the difference between this N and this N. This, down here, is a lowercase N that is italicized. That means if it's italicized, it's a variable, right? Or it's a, a yeah, it's not a unit. Whereas this, not italics, that represents a unit. So a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. That's the unit of force that we talked about in chapter one. Now, if you have trouble remembering it, look at this. Mg is very common force. Uh, we're going to talk about this. So near Earth surface, Mg is going to apply. And I use this to figure out my units. Mass has units of kilograms. G has units of meters per second squared. And so if you have something that is equivalent to the units of Mg, you have a unit of force. So notice it's just a different way of grouping it. If you have a mass times an acceleration, that is the same units as a force. That matches up with what we say right here in Newton's second law. Sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. So we see that the units of force are the units of mass times meters per second squared. Kilograms times a meter per second squared. So all the time, you might hear me say this, are the units of force mg? That's what I mean by that. Are they the same as mg? All right. Um, now this one right here, whoops, sorry, lost my marker. This one right here, we're going to talk about this in chapter 13. All right. So we will get to that in this semester. We'll talk about astronomical gravity or Newton's universal uh, gravity, universal gravitation. So more on that later. Um, to be clear, here are some pet peeves I have. Gravity is a force. G is not it's a magnitude of a gravitational acceleration during free fall near the Earth's surface. So be, know that there's a big difference between G and gravity. G is not gravity. Gravity is a force. G is the magnitude of acceleration due to gravity when you're in free fall. Just be aware that that drives me crazy. So if you want to drive me crazy, that's cool. All right. Um, in chapter six, we're going to talk about friction a lot. All right. So um, I'm going to use lowercase f for friction. Sometimes textbooks will use force due to friction here. Sometimes people will use uh, w, uh, or sometimes people might use the force due to gravity here. So these are all some different symbols. Uh, like I said, sometimes people use force due to the normal force. Um, now for me, a capital F is usually some force that's applied. It's like a zombie pushing on something or a person pulling on something with a string or whatever. Um, there's going to be a spring force. We'll talk about that much uh, later in chapter seven, I think. Um, so notice there's going to be the force. This is something you have to watch out for in every problem. There's a force vector, and then there's a force magnitude, and you have to always be looking at the definitions in your book. You have to be reading carefully all the time. Physicists are notoriously sloppy with whether they clearly state if it's a magnitude or a vector. And so all the time be reading and thinking 
do some thinking sometimes. Is So this equation over here talks about a force magnitude. More on that in chapter seven. Let's scroll down. Um, there's electric forces. There's many other forces. And at some point, we've got to get to it. Um, some, some little uh, comments here. Let's make sure I hit all these. T, lowercase, is usually going to be time in my notes. Uppercase T is usually going to be tension. Uh, lowercase n is normal force. Upper, that's okay, cool. We talked about lowercase f is going to be reserved for friction. And capital F is usually something push or you know, pulling. Um, all right. And then this one, it turns out in very unusual cases, you can actually get, you can think of like a negative normal force. But usually we assume all these magnitudes are positive. So one of the things we're going to try to do is we're going to try and draw pictures with force arrows so that the magnitudes are positive. Let me give you an example of what we don't usually do. Just to be clear that that's not really messing with you. Okay. So imagine you had a block sitting on a table. Well, there's its weight pulling it down. And usually, instead of writing the symbol lowercase w, most people just say mg in a physics class because that would be the mass of the object times g. This will become obvious why we do it once we do a problem or two. Now, you could say there's a normal force, right? You could draw it this way and then say n is a negative number. That's generally a terrible idea. That doesn't make sense with what people think in their minds when they visualize this. Normally, we think the normal force is pushing up from the, whoops, from the ground. So normally, we'll write this, right? That, that said, in weird cases, you could actually talk about a negative normal force. Uh, for example, if you have a superconductor on a magnetic track, you could argue that's equivalent to a negative normal force or something. But let's uh, generally try to avoid that. So that's what this picture is saying. Generally speaking, in this picture, these symbols are all positive. G is always positive. It's 9.8. It's the magnitude of acceleration due to gravity and free fall. M is a mass. You stick a balance on, you shouldn't get a negative reading for mass unless you screwed up the zeroing of the scale. So mass is a positive number. G is a positive number. We want N to correspond to the magnitude of the normal force. We want that to be a positive number. So when we're drawing pictures, you have to think a little bit as you draw your pictures and make sure the forces are pointing the right way so that it makes sense when we interpret these symbols as magnitudes. To be clear, N is not equal to N. This is the vector and it's going to have i-hats or j-hats. This is the magnitude, no i-hats or j-hats. So, all right, that's, that's plenty of time to deliberate on that. Uh, let me check. Any questions? Just checking in. All right. So let's see here. Um, go ahead and look at page 84, and I'm going to get you guys a, a fun link here. Okay, so I made some videos over the weekend. Let me see if I can get that. You guys look at page 84, and let me see if I can find these videos here. Um, whoops, I got to do this, do that. I have it queued up here somewhere. Right, right here. Whoops. Oh, let's just see if I can screen share it. I've got it right here. All right, so here's two masses. I'm looking at question 5.1 on page 84. And just so we've got it, I'll bring up the this first so you can all see it just in case you don't have your book. So I'm looking at this one, a tale of two strings, all right? So now in this case, you have a ball with a large mass uh, tied uh, okay, basically it looks like this, right? I don't know if you could see this, but in here, there's a string that's holding this one up and it's very faint. There's a string that's holding this one up. And then there's a string down here to this one. And this one has a string that goes to the rod in the back. Okay, so the idea is there's strings holding this up and you, it's just hard to see from this angle. Okay, all right. And then, whoops, let's go back to the question. Okay, so we're going to pull one of them with a quick hard jerk and one of them we're gonna pull very slowly. 
So think to yourself, which string will break? And then I'll play the video in just a second, okay? So think to yourself, in each of these cases, which string should break? I'll pause. I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it. Maybe I'll find that water really quick. I'll be right back. All right, let's go take a look at the video. And so eventually I'll put the link to this video in here. But let's take a look here. Maybe. I hope you could see the difference there. So in this case, it's still faint, but the string is here. So when you do a quick jerk, the idea here is this is a large mass. That's a one kilogram mass. And so if you jerk very quickly on the string, the lower string snaps. What is this showing? It's saying this mass is huge, so it has a small acceleration, right? So F equals, how about I say it like this? Acceleration equals force over mass. And I'm taking off all the vectors just to speed this up. So everything's in one direction here. And let's just assume this is all uh, plus or minus numbers. But the idea here is, okay, if you apply a large force, but you have a large mass, the acceleration can be pretty small. So when you watch this thing, this mass doesn't accelerate very much. So the bottom string gets stretched and snaps. In the other case, where you have this big mass sitting here, and you pull very slowly, well, as you pull very slowly, right, this thing doesn't need to accelerate very much. And all the force that you're applying essentially gets transmitted to the upper string because we don't have this quick jerk phenomenon, right? So when you do that, the upper string breaks because you're applying the force slowly. The mass in the middle doesn't need to accelerate very rapidly. If you have to make this mass accelerate very rapidly, that's difficult. The upper string doesn't stretch as much. Um, questions on that? I think I said this in the workbook too. You could also check the answers in the workbook. Uh, let me see if I could find another one here. I think this one's pretty fun. Um, this is the stuff I usually let students do in class, right? So uh, let me, whoops, get out of this one, escape. Whoops. Oh, well, here we go. This is from last week, sorry. How do I get that going there? If you're curious about the shoot the monkey here, you know what, I'm gonna give this to you later, but you can see I set this up and I actually did shoot the monkey. So I'll send that one to you afterwards, all right? But I wanna to get to this broomstick one. Um, how do I shirt, okay. There we go. Let's watch this one together. And I don't care if you guys can't hear the sounds here. Okay, so um, to be clear here, let me explain what's going on. Notice there's a wine glass right there and a wine glass right here, and you can't really see it, but somewhere right here, there's a pin sticking out of each end of the broomstick. Now to give you a better feeling for what this looks like, it's the next paragraph on page 84. So let me, um, whoops, ah, let me get you that, okay, any day now. Whoops, I'll just show you this really quick. So we're looking at this one now, broomstick. So I don't know if this gives you a better picture over here, but uh, they used to do this with circus performers and they'd tie strings onto the ears and then smash it with a pipe. So let's go watch the video here and just watch it. All right, let me make this bigger. Here we go.
Notice the wine glasses don't move at all. Jeez. Hold on. Got so many clicks. All right, let's get this out of here. Let's get this out of here. Sorry, I've got a lot, a lot of stuff going on here. There we go. Whew, I'm back to Zoom here. All right, so the point of those demonstrations was just to show you uh, kind of this weird phenomenon. And this is the same thing that happens in the uh, tablecloth trick, right? If you have something sitting on a tablecloth and you jerk it very quickly, in those cases, we see this interesting phenomenon where a very quickly applied force to a large mass object, we notice that the object doesn't accelerate very much, right? Because if you have a large mass, your acceleration could be low and we get these unusual phenomenon. Obviously, if you pull a tablecloth very slowly, you're just gonna drag all the dishes onto the floor and break them, right? Whereas if you do that very quickly, um, you get the large masses will stay approximately in place because the, the acceleration is small and it's acting on them for a short amount of time. You do some kinematics with a small acceleration in a small time, you don't get much speed up, etc. This is discussed in uh, section 5.2 and I'll send you a video of that later. But the fact remains is Newton's second law seems to work in a wide variety of cases in the real world. All right. Um, all right. So now let's do some simple problems uh, where we look at just the practicality, how I want you to learn to set up your force diagrams. So, um, Professor? Yeah, question. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain how it worked with the string in the ball, the two strings in the ball, and how, um, how the quick jerk. Yeah, I, I don't know if you heard that. I explained that already, but it is linked in the solution. So I'll tell you later, Dom, but I want to keep rolling now because I already explained that once. I'll, I'll definitely help you later because there might have just been a weird internet. Um, short version, if you apply force quickly, the heavy object doesn't have much time to accelerate. If the heavy object doesn't have much time to accelerate, the other side of the string is not going to stretch that much, whereas the side underneath it will stretch a lot. It's the lower string snaps. That's what's kind of weird. More later. Okay. Let's go back to here. So I'll try and get all these videos linked in the solutions. I spent all this time making them. I haven't linked them in the solutions yet. I've got a really fun one here, but all of these things are explained at the bottom of the page, right? So if you want, you can read that. That said, I want to start right here with this simple one uh, right here. And some of you maybe have had me for class already. If you have had me for class already and you already are quite familiar with my style of working, this might be a good time to start doing problems out of the workbook that you know are going to be due for class and you could stop listening to me. If you're not used to me or if you've never had me in class, I recommend you watch me just to get some basics here. All right, so this is what we're doing. We wanna look at this problem. I'm gonna sketch it out on the board, just a second, and then I'll stop the screen share, okay? And then, where's my... Okay, so we're trying to analyze the forces. We're given the acceleration magnitude A. All right. So we've got this picture here, okay? Now, a free body diagram, the first thing you do, it means draw only one body. So we're going to draw what's called a free body diagram. That's one object, one body, all by itself. And then I'm going to draw on this object, I will draw all forces which act on this object. Forces. So in this case, What's one force acting on this object? Tension. Tension, all right. Now, tension is probably going up because the string was pulling up on it, right? That's usually pretty straightforward. I'm gonna label it with a, a capital T, not a lowercase t. All right, what's another force? I'll wait for it. Mg. Yep. 
Which force should be larger in this problem? If you had to guess, are they the same size or is one of them perhaps slightly larger? MG is larger. Yeah, how do you know MG should be slightly larger? What's the clue? The acceleration is downwards. Yeah, we know it's basically like a tug of war. And we see that the weight is pulling downwards, tension's pulling upwards. The problem specifically tells us it accelerates downwards with magnitude A. That means the downwards force should be larger than the upwards force. If they were balanced, would it be at rest? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. If they're balanced, the acceleration would be zero. It would either be at rest, static equilibrium, or moving with constant velocity. This happens in elevators all the time, right? It accelerates to get up to speed, then it moves with constant velocity, then it slows down. So this is very, all right, whatever. All right, in this case, now what I'm going to do, if you could get used to this aspect, what I'm about to do, this section will be easy for you. All right, so I'm going to compare these arrows to the coordinate system to get the signs. So in this case, mg is a force. I'm going to write mg. Next, I notice that this arrowhead is opposite the coordinate system, so that's why it gets a minus. All right, next, I see that tension matches that, so I'll get a tension... And because these two match directions, I'll get a plus. Let's keep going. Equals mass. And now I need to put in the acceleration. Okay, so this is the net force. Notice that comes from the arrows. So the arrows on the force diagram or the free body diagram tell us the plus minus signs. Over here, we get mass times acceleration. Okay, this is simply Newton's second law. If you remember, the sum of forces as vectors equal mass times acceleration. But we've got to be careful here. All right, in this case, this acceleration, the arrowhead points opposite the coordinate system, so I would also put a minus sign on that. This is the one that people screw up sometimes. If your acceleration has some magnitude opposite the coordinate system, you have to write M negative A. Now, be careful here. Why do we have to spend so much time on this? Why do, it's because this is a vector equation, right? So on this, you're essentially assuming there's a J hat on each side, right? Because there's a, right? We're doing forces in this case in the Y direction. So if I, if I did this, take a look. This equation would still be equal if I multiplied everything by a J hat. And so what we would normally do is the first thing, if every term has a J hat in it, I would immediately cancel it out. So I'm going to pause for a second and make sure this makes some sense. Again, I get an acceleration in the negative J hat. I have a tension in the positive J hat. I have an MG in the negative J hat. And so we see that the minus signs come from the J hat, which then immediately gets canceled. And that's why we never really write the J hat in the first place. And so, yeah, again, the minus signs come from the arrow relative to the coordinate system. It's not the arrow by itself. It's the arrow relative to the coordinate system, just like in 2D projectiles. I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions here. Um, whoops. Oops, there we go. Any questions so far? That's the key. As long as you get used to forcing yourself to check the arrow relative to your coordinate system on every problem. Another thing. Oops. Ah, 
whatever. There we go. Another thing, always watch. Notice I did not draw the acceleration touching the object. A free body diagram is this. This is a good free body diagram. So it's not a force body diagram. It's a free body diagram. And we'll get lazy and just call it an F B D free body diagram, not force body diagram. Okay. So notice you draw the body all by itself. You draw the forces acting on it. This is Newton's second law. It doesn't necessarily look exactly the same as up here because we got rid of all the J hats, but it's essentially Newton's second law. All right. So from there, it's just algebra. Tension should equal mass times, what is it going to be? I think it's going to be G minus A when you're all done. All right. So this would be the tension magnitude. We're going to get lazy and say, what's the tension? But to be clear, this is a tension magnitude. Does this have the right units? You could say, well, I need to get Newtons. What's a Newton? A Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So look, I've got a kilogram here. And each of these is a meter per second squared. And so notice you get a kilogram times a meter per second squared, which is a Newton. Or you could just say the units are MGs. Right? The units are the same as the units of mg, and that's a sign that it's a force. All right. What do you think? So far, so good? Quick question. Do you guys like it when I try to show you a quick video snippet or not? Just be honest. Do you like that or not? Or does it, is it a time waste? I, I think it helps conceptualize the idea. Yeah, it just helps like, you see something in motion. Yeah, cool. Because like I, I didn't see those the two weights on the string. We didn't see that last semester. And right. so it was, when you read the solution, it was kind of hard to visualize it. But now that you show the picture, I was like, OK, I, I see that. OK, well, in that case, I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, so and if I'm ever wasting your time, you could either send me an email or say chat like, dude, this is killing me. All right, so I, I think it's cool to see him in action. I wish I had it timed better, but it's like I'm doing the best I can. So that said, I'm going to show you some more videos here. All right, so um, so let's see here. Where is it? Okay, let's go to videos. Sorry, I need to organize it. I've been spending so much time making these videos, I haven't had time to organize them. Jeez, uh, where is that one? Okay, here it is. So let's take a look at this one. Okay, so here is the, the story. I'm gonna, because I know you can't hear, this is reading the tension in Newton's. Sorry, it kind of got cut off there, that's Newton's. Now, I wanna be clear here, this minus sign comes from the way that this sensor, this sensor is recording that. And so I've got it upside down. I don't really wanna spend all day on it, but just ignore the minus sign. And we're looking at the magnitude of the tension in the string. Now, what you can't see right now is there's the string, you see it kind of running there. My hand is holding that off screen right there. So I'm keeping it in place. So this is a 12 Newton weight right now. So that's a 12 Newton weight that I'm holding at rest. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to release it. And I believe this one is going to fall down. Okay. Okay. Okay, whoops, oh my gosh, it's, it's loading there. But so the idea is I'm going to release it from rest here and it's going to accelerate downwards. Think, should the tension be larger than 12 
equal to 12 or less than 12? That's the question here. Based off what we just saw, maybe, oh my gosh, really? Here it goes. Okay, and so, <laughs> okay, in this case, you saw, hopefully, while it was accelerating downwards, it happened very quickly, we saw that the tension drops. Now it's laying on the ground, by the way. So once it's on the ground, there's almost no tension in the string. All right, so let's go back and take a look at this. On the other one, if it's accelerating up, Okay, so in this one, now that I've got it queued up, it's gonna accelerate upwards. And so in this case, notice the mass is actually closer to one kilogram. So I have a one kilogram mass. So the mass is one kilogram. Notice that mg, right? Think about that, g is about 10. So notice mg is about 10 Newtons. So I have a, approximately a one kilogram bag of sand. This one is gonna accelerate upwards. So, and again, ignore the minus sign here, just get the magnitude. When I hit play, we're going to look at the acceleration upwards. What should happen to the scale reading? And so while it's accelerating upwards, we see the tension exceeds that. Oh, come on, zoom. All right, so, all right. And then I think if I'm careful here, you can see this just takes forever to do this stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh, where is this one? Oh my gosh, I had this one somewhere. Uh, where is that? Oh my gosh, how about, um, oh, I gotta look at my channel. Oh my gosh. You can control F your YouTube page. Yeah, you that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Scale, scale. Can I go down to the next one? There it is. I was close. I thought it was near the bottom. All right, and so, uh, thank you for that. Uh, this is the last one, and this is just showing what happens. So I'm going to um, put this on here. Notice it's approximately one kilogram mass on the scale. So I'm looking right here. Notice I just put this as a one kilogram mass. So notice we're right at 10 Newtons again. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop this thing. All right, and so before we do that, it's this problem right here, right here, and I'm gonna drop it. What do you think should be the scale reading when I drop it? Think to yourself. There's our work. When you drop this thing, what should be the scale reading? Or you could go ahead and shout it out if you think. Will it be zero? If you drop it, what value does A take? Um, G or? And G minus G is? Zero. Let's go take a look. Whoops, it's somewhere right here. Oh, that was pretty fast. I'm gonna play it back a little slower here. Oh, it's a lot easier in class, but let's do this. Here we go. <laughs> It's pretty blurry, but I hope you saw that the needle definitely trended towards zero. It went so rapidly. So this actually works in, when you're in free fall, you feel 
weightless. Are you weightless? What is the definition of weight? What do you think? Your the amount of force gravity is putting on you towards yeah. Earth. So in that problem, was the mass weightless? What do you think, Gage? I mean, technically, no. No, it wasn't. No. It wasn't weightless. And so think about the moon as it orbits the planet. What force attracts the moon to our planet? Gravity, because it's gravity falling. Yeah. So what happens is astronauts in orbit are attracted to the Earth. Otherwise, they wouldn't stay in orbit. They'd go somewhere else. So they feel weightless because they're constantly falling towards the Earth. They just never hit the Earth, right? So when you are in the vomit comet, right? Gravity is still acting on you. The vomit comet is that zero-G training flight. Back in the day, uh, when I first got hired at Hancock, I got to take a flight on the vomit comet. And it, it made some lady puke right next to me. It was a very unpleasant uh, smell. But the idea is, yeah, you're, you're flying around. You feel weightless, but it's just because you're falling. What's making you fall? The force of weight. So yeah, uh, people, students have a very strange... We'll go into this more in chapter 13, but just for right now, know that uh, even when you go up into space, you're not weightless. There was that Red Bull guy that jumped out of a rocket and fell towards Earth. He clearly wasn't weightless. He dropped straight down. Now, if you're going very quickly around the Earth as you fall... Right, You keep curving towards the Earth, but you're going so fast that the curve of your projectile motion ends up being a circle all the way around the Earth and you never hit. All right. Even weirder, if you have a tiny bit of atmospheric resistance, it can actually cause you to go to a lower orbit and speed you up. So air resistance can speed you up in high altitude orbits. What? Air resistance does not slow you down up there. It speeds you up. And then you spiral in and blow up. Weird, weird stuff. It's a very unusual situation where atmospheric resistance causes an increase in velocity. We'll talk about that more later too. All right. Um, whew, good enough. Let's take a look now. Uh, let me go back to here. So let's say we're looking at this one. All right. And so you've got a mass hanging on a figure. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this black ring is supposed to be a washer right here. This thing, that's just a washer. And then there's strings attached in different directions. And so if you want to get a feel for this, what would that look like in real life? So I'll just give you a second. We're going to hang it up there. We'll read these questions in a minute. I want to give you a visual of what this looks like. So let's go to here. And let's go to, whoops, escape, come on. And let's go to back and then I think it's, let's try this one here. This is supposed to be a video of what that looks like if it pops up. So I'm gonna hang a mass on one of these scales. Whoops. All right. And there's the washer right there. And so notice this is exactly that problem. If I could, I'll get this out of here. This is one scale reading. I forget this is, I think in the problem, I think this is T2. Okay, over here, this is going to be T1. And then down here, this is scale T3. There's the washer right there. And notice it's kind of hard to see, but this inner scale, this one's about 5.5 Newtons. All right. And then this one up here is closer to like 9.6 Newtons. So I'm reading the tension is on the inner scale. So that's right there, about 9.6. Notice there's also angles. So this one is about 10, 20, 32 degrees from there or something like that. And whereas this one is, 
Uh, it looks like it's 10, 20, 30, maybe 35 degrees coming this way. So we could in theory get the angles and notice uh, again, this is straight down this one. So that's the problem we're looking at. The main thing that I wanna point out here, this is about 10 Newton. We'll say, even if we read this, um, it turns out the scale itself has a small amount of uh, weight that is not being registered by the scale. So this one actually, if you account for the weight of the scale itself, this one's actually close to about 10.5 Newtons, all right? So again, I'm accounting for this mass right here. And actually it might even be closer to 11. I think it's 1.5 Newton scale, all right? So that's the weight associated with the scale. So let's say this adds up to 11 Newtons. My point here is 9.6 plus 5.5 equals 11, if you do this with vectors. And so students, when you're first thinking, if everything's in straight lines, it's really easy, but we could see that real life scales require us to do vector math. That was the point of this. I'm gonna pause for a second, shut up, see if there's any questions about this setup. Any questions? The numbers appear to not make sense. That's okay if we start doing vectors. So going to here, right? The idea is we cannot think of these tensions as magnitudes and add up the magnitudes only. We need to do this as a vector and this is a vector. So I think in this problem, we had about 60 degrees here and about uh, 35 or maybe this was 55 degrees or something like that. And I think this was actually closer to 58 degrees. So those were the angles I measured. This one was something like 5.5 Newtons. If you wanna write these numbers down, you can. And we said that this one right here, we expected this one, if you included the scale itself, should be about 11 Newtons, all right? And then this one right here, we said was something like 9.6 Newtons. Those were the numbers we saw in a video. So at the end of this problem, if you write those down, all right? you could check with a real life situation after we finish part E really quickly by just plugging in your numbers and see if it's right, okay? All right, so that said, let's start with part A. Under what circumstances should T3 equal MG? What do you think? Under what circumstances will this tension be equivalent to this mass times G? With no acceleration? Yeah. So in this problem, you just saw in the video, there was no acceleration. So if there's no A, T3 equals MG. I'll show you that. I'll show you that right here. Whoops. If there's no acceleration, the tension should equal the weight, right? So again, if this goes away, tension equals mg. So that's what we had. If we're not accelerating up or down, we, we've seen all the cases, accelerating up, accelerating down, free fall. And now the last case, what if there's no acceleration? Well, under those circumstances, scales read your true weight. That's cool. All right, so if you stand on a scale in an elevator, it's not gonna work all the time only when it's moving with constant velocity or at rest. All right, so let's take a look at this one now. I'm gonna bring it back up and let's, let's try and draw this out. All right, so I'm gonna work on drawing my picture of 5.6. Try to draw an FBD of the washer, okay? All right, that's good. I can, I'll do this with you. All right, so this one, Remember, we're doing an FBD. I'll draw the object. I'll just draw a dot, okay? So now there's a force this way. We could say T3 or we could say MG, either one, because A equals zero. I'm gonna register that information here like that. 
Okay. Now, just pardon me for a second. I'm going to try and color code this the same as my solution. Looks like I used green for T1 and blue for T2. So just trying to make this match. We're told that this angle right here is theta. Yes. Now notice what I've done. I've drawn the X component and the Y component. These components match those coordinate system arrows. I drew little arrows here. So if this side is T2, this side is opposite that angle. I should write this is T2, what? Sine or cosine of theta? Sine. Sine. And this happens all the time in a real world experiment depending on those protractors, right? I'll just show you in a real life experiment. Like this, sometimes you don't get the angle you want. Sometimes you get an angle to the vertical, right? Sometimes it's easier to read this angle. Sometimes it's easier to read that angle. So you don't always get the easy angle. All right, so that's the point that I'm trying to make here. Now, in this particular problem, we could debate whether or not that was a smart call, but whatever. The fact is, sometimes you get angles up here, sometimes you get angles there. You need to learn how to handle it. The most common mistake students make here is they'll accidentally call this cosine. In a math class, the X component always gets cosine because mathematicians don't have to deal with the real world like the rest of us. So now, before you get upset, I'm a mathematician too. I love math. So yeah, all right, anyways. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to make fun of mathematicians, just like I make fun of chemists. That's like par for the physics course, okay? All right. I actually really like math. All right. I used to host the math team for Hancock. That's old school. All right. Now we got this other one that's kind of going up this way. This one's T1. Let me scoot back just a hair so I can see my full coordinate system. Good pictures, you spend less time working, more time partying. Bad pictures, you spend more time retaking my class, okay? It's just the way it is. Now up here, this angle was phi. Notice phi does not look like theta, okay? Learn how to draw the two symbols correctly and you will save yourself a headache. For me, if this angle's phi, I guess we could have gone like this, right? Or I could do alternate interiors and say this angle down here is phi. Either way, notice this has a component to the left and a component up. Either picture works. I just kind of get in this habit down here. Either way would work. So this side would be T1 sine or cosine of phi. Cosine. Cosine. I'm adjacent to this angle. And that means this must be T1 sine phi. All right. At this point, you know you've got the solutions, but we could also see if you know what you're doing. Now I want to see, can you get the right plus minus signs on all this stuff? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to write some of forces, and in this particular problem, I wanna do the y direction first. You don't have to know why. You'll see why in a minute. It'll just save me some erasing later, okay? I wanna talk about the forces in the y direction. So uh, somebody new, somebody that hasn't spoken up today, take a chance, it's okay. I promise I won't make fun of you or be mean. Just take a guess, give me a force or a force component that is in the y direction. Right, so tell me something that's lined up with the y axis. Go ahead, hit on mute and tell me. T1 sine phi. 
T1 sine phi, correct. According to this picture in this coordinate system, would that be positive or negative? Positive. Positive, all right, so T1 sine phi. Now I could draw a little plus symbol here, but why bother? It's the first term. If it's positive, I'll just leave it alone. But you could write that there. Cool, this is in the positive J hat, good. All right, somebody else, give me another one. T2 cosine theta. Positive or negative? Positive. Positive, agreed. Cosine theta, and I'm making sure I keep my thetas with the horizontal line and phi with a near vertical diagonal line. All right, anything else, or are we done? Minus mg. Minus mg. That is all of the y arrows, agreed? When you're done with the arrows that are, you have to double check. This is one, two, three, got it. Then you write the equals, okay? Remember, we are trying to write Newton's second law. Newton's second law isn't sum of forces. Newton's second law is sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. A lot of students will just stop right here. That's not an equation. This is worthless. You have to say what it's equal to. So in this particular case, what is this equal to? Mass times, what's the acceleration in this problem? Zero. Zero. And notice I put mass times acceleration in the y direction because I'm doing sum of forces in the y direction. This part is the j hat part of all these arrows, right? So I'm looking at just the j hats. Again, you could put a j hat on each one of these terms and it would be a totally sensible equation. But we would immediately drop that out because it cancels out in all terms. So we rarely write that, but it is there in your mind. And somebody just told me this is zero. So that means I could rewrite this side of the equation and just say this happens to equal zero. Cool. Now, Let's do the same thing in the x direction. All right. What's that? Somebody, somebody new maybe. Take a chance, it's okay. Somebody new. Give me one force in the x direction. Uh, it could have T1 cosine. Outstanding. Phi, good. Phi, yeah. Nice. And so then the other one would be that one. Nice job. And then in this case, it's time. Is that a minus sign or a plus sign? This is a minus. Oh, wait, this, wait, this should be a plus sign right here. Yes, sorry. I was too busy. There we go. Like that? Good, Esteban? Thank you. And in this case, we don't have any acceleration up, down, left, or right. This would also equal zero, right? Okay. So now, cool. Now, in the video that you saw, I gave you all the numbers, but the idea is if you want to check if the stuff is for real or not, what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to assume one of the vectors I don't know. I'm going to use two of the vectors from the video that are known and see if it predicts correctly the third vector that the video shows. So in this case, let's read what the question says. Uh, um, and maybe I'll pause for a second before we do that. How, hopefully you're feeling all right on this, but I just want to pause and give you a chance to ask questions if you have any. All right. Let's go look and see what we're supposed to do next. So I have kind of stopped reading the question. That's always dangerous. So let's see what we've done. We did this. We talked about this. We did this. And that's where we're at. Okay, so part D says, figure out theta. Assume 
these things are known. All right. So, and then notice the other one says, assume, uh, eliminate theta and figure out T2. So basically let's assume this vector is unknown. All right. So if we don't know what this one is, we could use the other information to predict what that one is. And the answer should be able to just spit it out. So to save some time, Okay, come on, Zoom. There's getting a little lag there. There we go. Let's go to the solutions here. So notice, here's our two equations. And here's a standard technique. If you haven't seen this technique, look what I did. I regrouped those equations. And notice right here, what I did is I basically took all this stuff and moved it to the other side. And then I took all this stuff and moved that to the other side. And that's how I got these two equations. So take a second and make sure you believe that. Notice you get a sign flip on everything. Then you take a ratio. When you take the ratio, the T2 drops out and you get tangent theta. equals a bunch of crap. Then you take tangent inverse of both sides and you get this answer. It's ugly. So what? It works. That is the idea. If we took the numbers from the other scale reading, this is the 9.6, this was the 11, because we had to include the scale itself, and then this one is uh, 9.6, and I forget what the angle was, but you could punch in all those numbers and see if you get the correct predicted angle, which I think we said was about 55, right? I think theta was supposed to be 55. Similarly, let's scroll down a bit. In this case, you could take those two equations, solve them the same way. You take this equation and square it, and you take that equation and square it. And notice you have to do the same thing to both sides. If I square the left side of this equation, I also square the right side of that equation. If I square the left side of this equation, I gotta square all of that junk. And that's the one that gets ugly. Okay, that's fine. So if you do that, then you get, you add these equations together. So in this case, you take these two equations, you square them and add them, and you get sine squared plus cosine squared. Well, isn't that just one? As long as it's the same angle, it is. Sin and then you get T2, you could take a square root. And so at this point, that's just boring math. All right, the fact of the matter is I'm trying to show you, whoops, let me get me on the screen. These are standard physics tricks. We saw them in the, the relative velocity problems. There was some similar math up there. And so all the time you're going to get this type of trick where you have to take a ratio and you get the force dropping out and you can figure out the angle or you could square the two components and add them together and then you get the force magnitude without the angle. This is so common. I wanted to show you both of those tricks. Now, um, I know you've got the solutions. You could go through that at home, but I want to pause and see if there's any questions on that. I'm kind of going a little bit quickly, but again, everybody's supposed to have seen this at some point. All right, that's good. So if you want to, you could check those numbers. Um, at this point, that's a good introduction to some forced topics. I say we take a short break. So let's take an eight minute break. Let's come back at one. 25 and regroup. If you're really curious, you could plug in those numbers from the video and see what they are. All right. So take a quick break. Eight minutes.
Okay, so I put the, um, I've been trying to organize things and it's just, it takes a long time to make these videos. Um, it turns out a two to three second video can sometimes take me two to three hours uh, to get it set up. Uh, you wouldn't think so, but it turns out it's a lot easier to do these in class than to record them for class and make everything visible with the lighting and blah, blah, blah. But so um, I, I don't have these organized that well yet, but um, I'm going to do some more of these right now. Um, just to kind of, if you want, the monkey and the hunter is in there in a couple of different ways. I show you that that works just like we did with the simulation. And I showed that it actually works regardless of the bullet speed. So there's a couple of videos in there. Um, that said, I want to make sure we talk a little bit. Let's take a look at um, the bottom of page 86. The bottom of page 86. And I'll do a quick screen share there. Concept question. Okay. Let's look at this one. All right. So on the bottom of page 86, I'm looking at question 5.13. So notice that we're looking at a top view of a tube, okay? And so you're going to take this marble, you're going to flick it in there, and it's going to go through this circular pipe. And then when it comes out the other side, which path best approximates the trajectory of the marble as it leaves the tube? Is it going to be A, B, C, or D? Is it going to be straight line, uh, left, right? What do you think? So think to yourself. Don't think too long. Just take a guess. Remember, educational research has shown by taking a guess and committing to it, you remember the actual answer better. So let's go take a look at it. Where is that one? Oh my gosh. There it is. Maybe. So I'm squatting on the ground. There's the marble. I'm going to flick it in here. And notice it comes out in a straight line path. Whoops. Let's go back there. Now it's already doing something. But the idea, oh my gosh. When we do this one, I'll pause here. There. So notice a lot of people have this mistaken uh, conception, right? There's a force the tube is constantly pushing the marble towards the center, right? That's what causes this marble to go around in the curved path. Instead of going straight off this way or straight off this way or straight off this way, right? And then what happens here is when it's coming out, there's a force towards the center, but the second it leaves, that tube is no longer present. Without that force present, the marble tends to go in a straight line path. This is just a conceptual question supposed to show you that without a force causing it to turn in a circle, the marble won't go in a circle. And maybe that was obvious to you, but it turns out statistically, many students kind of get freaked out by that one. So just remember that. Um, and then another one that I wanted to show you here, let's, let's see how you do with this before we do a problem on it. Let me see where this one is. Um, where was it? There it is. Okay. So in this one, I'll kind of talk you through this. Okay. So what's happening here, uh, and I'll explain this, what, cause you can't hear the video. There's a string right here. I don't know if you can see that string. There's a string going up the hill and you're sitting on a scale. And so the idea in this case, while that video runs, basically there's a scale that's going to provide a normal force and a, and a string that provides a tension. Okay. So we've got a tension and a normal force. And obviously there's going to be MG straight down if I could draw it. And so I'm going to change the angle here. I'm going to lift this up in just a second. And notice this, if you ignore that minus sign, gives you the tension magnitude. 
that is the scale reading that basically gives you the normal force. So if you multiply that number by 9.8, you get the normal force. So the question is, uh, again, ignore that minus sign. So as I raise this thing up to a larger angle, what do you think will happen to the tension and the normal force? So I'm gonna show you the picture on my whiteboard. Let's say we have this situation like this. We've got a string supporting this mass here. This is coming straight down. So this is the weight of an object, mg. There's a normal force. Normal forces are always perpendicular. Sorry. So there we go. So we have these forces like this. Now, it's very similar to the problem we just looked at. My question is, if I increase the ramp angle, what should happen to these two numbers? We can look at them on those scale readings. Again, this is essentially the scale times the number 9.8 gives you the normal force in Newtons. Over here, we were literally reading the scale directly. And again, there's that weird minus sign issue that we don't wanna talk about because of the way it's easy to tie strings on that scale. Okay, so what should happen to this? And to be clear, this thing is sitting on a ramp with some angle theta. If theta becomes a bigger angle, what should happen to these two scale readings? What do you think? Anybody? A normal force should probably go down, right? The increase. Okay. And what's your thought process, I guess? Or why, why do you think that? So I was thinking uh, if it was completely straight, and would it exactly equal mg. Yeah, so if and it was so, all the way level, this would support all of the weight. So as you yeah. angle it, yeah. What, what's supporting more and more of the weight as you angle it? As you increase the angle, what has to support more and more of the weight? The tension. The tension, the string. And so what we're seeing here is it's very similar to what we just looked at, except now, instead of having scales going this way and that way, we're gonna talk about normal force and tension. So let's just see if this is actually verified in a real life experiment, right? It, so as we crank this up, am I ever gonna do it? Okay, so here it goes. I'm gonna lift the numbers. So it's about 1.4 and three. And notice this, the, the tension goes up a lot and the normal force goes down just a little bit, right? It went from 1.4 down to about 1.3. So the normal force does decrease slightly. It doesn't stay constant, but we see that the tension goes up dramatically. Okay, now if it helps... Let's convert this number to see why this still makes sense. Remember, we have to multiply this by about 10 to get the normal force. So this is actually about 13 Newtons. And it used to be about 14 Newtons. So we lost one Newton of normal force and we gained three Newtons or so, or maybe even four Newtons of tension. But remember, we see that these numbers, whoops, let's get over to here. The idea is, I guess, to keep this more in tune with what we saw in the picture, initially, the normal force is holding up almost all of this, right? It's about four, maybe five times bigger. So one, two, three, four, about like this. And what happens here is, as you go to a steeper angle, this one gets a lot bigger, and this one just gets a little smaller, but it's still the lar much larger force. Whoops, sorry. So the normal force stays about the same, but it does shrink a little. The tension force gets a lot larger. And because these two are at right angles, when you do the quadratic formula on them and add them together, it turns out this number, uh, even though it blows up a lot, doesn't change the net magnitude a ton. It still balances out to that mg, all right? And so one of the things that I'm showing you this for is I want you to get used to, rather than try and think through all this for every problem, it gets very complicated in a hurry. What if we threw in friction? Man, this is gonna get out of control in a hurry. 
the best way to analyze force problems is not to try and do all this thinking every time. It's to draw a picture, write your force equations, solve for something, and then interpret it. All right. That is what will help us succeed. Draw a free body diagram of this object. That's what I did here so that we could see, oh, yeah, as this goes more upwards, this has to support more of the weight. Otherwise, the vectors don't balance. All right. So regarding that, I'm going to show you one of these problems that relates to this. If we go up on this page a bit. Uh, so let me just show you 5.8. 5.9 and 5.10 go into this in great detail. And um, so let's maybe look at 5.9 here, all right? So let's look at 5.9. This is a problem where there's an incline, there's different angles. We need to keep all this stuff straight. So what I want you to do right now is part A only. The rest of it, I'm gonna trust you could do algebra. So let's look at five. Oh, whoops, I'm not sharing screen. Let me fix that up. Sorry. Let's look at 5.9 here. Okay. Uh, and so let's work on part A, drawing the FED and the force equations. Parts B and C, you could do on your own. Algebra will become easy for you. All right. So look at 5.9. Think what you should draw. I'll draw it as well. If you're faster than me, you know what you could do. Read the solutions and check your own work. Okay. And maybe for this one, I'll do it live. So you could watch me or if you know what you're doing or think you know what you're doing, you do what you gotta do, okay? Let's say we have some angle here, theta. Notice I did not draw a small picture. I drew a big picture. If you're drawing small pictures, it's cool. I could still fail you, it's fine, right? If you draw big pictures, you're less likely to fail. That's what I'm really trying to say with that comment, right? Now, if you put a box here, okay, I know the gravitational force is pointing straight down. And one of the things students have a lot of trouble with here, normal in mathematics means perpendicular. So a normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. It's not straight up. So my normal force might actually be going this way, all right? So there's my normal force. Now in this case, there's a tension holding it up, but it's at some other weirdo angle. So this is even more different. So in this problem, the tension is going at some weird angle here. Now, I should be careful. I don't want to draw that. I don't know if we want to do it that way. Okay. When you're doing this problem, you might not have as much experience as I do. So I'm going to give you some advice. Okay, here is this picture. We could choose any coordinate system we want. And a lot of people, when they're first starting, might think, well, a normal XY coordinate system is the way to go. This is a valid choice of coordinate system. It turns out, I think it's a bad one for reasons I'll explain. Look at these vectors. This arrow does not line up with that coordinate system. You'd have to split it up. This arrow doesn't line up. Okay, so we'd have to split up these two vectors onto this coordinate system. This one would align with the coordinate system and we wouldn't have to split it up to understand it. So that's good. What if we did this coordinate system where I say X is going along the plane and Y. Now in this case, the normal force doesn't need to be split up. The tension still does need to be split up and MG also needs to be split up. So you might be saying, this is the same. Why don't I do it the normal way? Here's why. In the next chapter, if there's friction, usually friction would point parallel to the plane. And oftentimes things are going to be parallel or perpendicular to this plane. So it's very common to get multiple forces along the plane of motion. 
And if that's the case, and the acceleration is usually either up or down, right? And so the more vectors you have that align with your coordinate system, generally speaking, the better it is, the less work you have to do, the less SOHCAHTOA you have to do. And that means the fewer opportunities for you to screw up SOHCAHTOA. So generally speaking, this is how I would draw this coordinate system. In this particular problem, it's six of one half a dozen of the other. Later on, you will see this is the way to go. So if I choose that coordinate system, that's great. What was the acceleration in this problem? Let's take a look. Did it say? What's the acceleration in 5.9? Yeah, it's constant velocity. Zero. Yeah, zero. So this is the key word. It says it moves parallel to the ramp. So that's in a straight line with constant speed. So that's cool. That means we could say the acceleration is zero. And I'm going to say velocity vector is constant. Okay. All right. So now... I need to split up everything onto this coordinate system. Notice this is it might maybe it's a little weird because I'm drawing from an angle, but this is the coordinate I'm trying to draw, right? So there's this coordinate. This is supposed to be the Y coordinate. And there's this one, the X coordinate. All right. Sorry if it's a little, little crooked. All right. A lot of people start to say, well, what are all these different angles? In this case, I believe the problem said this was phi. Let's go back and look at it. Right there, phi. So that angle is phi. Okay, so that's easy. That means this vector is really easy to split up this way. And this way, this would be T uh, cos phi because it's adjacent to the angle. This is opposite. And notice this is the X component. It matches the X component of my coordinate system. This is the Y. It matches the Y component of my coordinate system. Okay. So the vector is split into components which match your choice of coordinate system. You could choose whatever you want. Just do what I recommend, okay? That's what I recommend for a reason. You'll see later. Now, MG. Everybody watch carefully. Watch carefully here. Maybe you're working on your own. Just please watch this one moment. This, what I'm about to do, is wrong. I'm going to split this up like that. Why is that wrong? It doesn't match the coordinate system I chose. This is not the X component. This matches that. See that difference? This is now parallel to my X component. Now I have a component that's parallel to the Y axis and I have one that's parallel to the X axis. Here is another way to tell this. The right angle is always opposite the initial vector. Your right arrow, right? If you're your components should always be smaller than the vector itself. The only way that's possible is if the hypotenuse of the triangle is the original vector. Okay. Uh, questions on that? That's sometimes a tricky spot for people. People have this habit to want to do that, and that's wrong. Okay. Another common thing people screw up. What's this angle? Check this out. I hope you could see this is a right angle right here.
This is theta. So what's this angle right here? 90 minus theta. 90 minus theta. If you're not sure how I got that, it's because all the vectors in the triangle have to add up to 180. Well, if this is 90 of it, these two have to add up to 90, complementary angles. So these two have to add up to 90, all right? So in this case, this plus that, all right. So now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't this also a right angle? Now it's getting kind of messy. Look at it. This is perpendicular to the coordinate system, right? This red line is perpendicular. So what's left for that angle right there? Theta. Theta. And then just to clear this up, this is looking very messy now. A free body diagram should only have the object and the forces acting on it. So what I do to make this look prettier is once I figure this out, I don't need this anymore. And I don't need that anymore. And I don't even need this object anymore. Now, obviously, it's going to be a little bit harder for you to erase than me. But generally speaking, when you look in the solutions, this is what it looks like. We erase all these extra coordinate system lines. And that's what it'll look like in the solutions. It's a lot less busy. It's easier to follow things. So if you're wondering where I got this from, you can go back and watch the live stream later on YouTube. Okay. Next, down here. This side, is it mg sine or is it mg cosine? To be clear, the hypotenuse here is mg. That's the full vector. So what's this side? mg sine, correct. And that means this side is adjacent. All right. And from there, we're off to the races. I'm going to pause and leave this up here. Any questions about how I got any of that? At this point, oops, let's go take a look. What problem was that? Five point something? I think it was this one, right? 5.9? Yeah, thanks. So that's how I got this picture. Is that making some sense? Here's the force equations. Take a second and make sure you believe these force equations. To be clear, this is the positive x direction. So this is pointing the same way, that's positive. This one is pointing the opposite way, that's why it gets a minus sign right there. Those are the only two forces in the x direction and acceleration in the x direction equals zero. So that's why this particular set of force equation is equal to zero. And looking at the y equation, you get a positive here, you get a positive there, you get a negative there. That's why this one is negative. And AY happens to be equal to zero. So we're good to go. All right, let's try another one. Okay, let's take a look here at... Um, the rest of that is algebra. You should do it. I want you to be fast at algebra, but the rest of it is pretty straightforward. It's just solving equations algebraically. You can do that. Um, if you have questions, I'll help you, but you got to do the work yourself. Let's take a look at 5.10. This is another really important problem. And the main step that we want to work on in class is the hard part. So this time, I'm not going to do it with you. I'm going to do it on my own board. You obviously can do it yourself. And if you're waiting for me, you could check the solutions. It's in there already. But go ahead, look at the equations for, see if you could draw the equations, basically do question 
let's see. Block of mass M, it's on an incline, it's a large angle. And then There's no friction, got some force with magnitude F. The force is in, uh, okay. Okay, so first I'm just trying to draw my FBD. This is what I came up with for my FBD. I assume there's a normal force perpendicular to the surface. There was an applied force with magnitude F. Notice I left out the arrow, this is the magnitude now, going straight that way. There's MG straight down. And look at this. I chose this as my coordinate system. You could have chosen something else. We could all choose different this. We should all have the same that. The force arrows should be the same. The coordinate system doesn't matter. It's just some coordinate systems are easier to work with. This is the one I chose. Generally speaking, my technique is to always align the x-axis with the positive acceleration if possible. Why? I find it easier to say F equals M positive A than M negative A. So if I align my coordinate system with the direction of acceleration, I find this easy. Check this out. The Y component of acceleration is zero. The X component is just A. It's very easy to solve for the acceleration if you need to. So that is why I do that. Do you need to? No but good luck trying to get the answers quickly if you don't do it the way I'm suggesting. So over time, I think you will be convinced this is a good strategy. It may feel really annoying to you. Maybe you're one of those people in high school and I always turned your paper. And so you could do that. Or you could just get used to doing things in what I think is a better way. I, you, you know, I'm not saying your high school physics teachers were telling you an incorrect method. That way works all the time. But what I've seen in my classes is, as the semester goes on and things get nastier, the benefits of this start to show up later. Obviously, in these early questions, any way you could do to get it right gets full credit. But please, at least give my method a shot, and I think you'll like it later on, especially in the second half of Chapter 6. Okay, just got to trust me that I'm not trying to make it hard for you. I'm trying to make it easier in the long run. All right. So in this case, when I see this, I need to split things up. Now from experience, I know that this angle in here is theta. Similarly, I've got to split this one up. Now, if you don't see that, remember you could always go down here we know that this angle right here was theta. That makes this 90 minus theta, right? If this is 90 minus theta, this is theta. Well, take a look. This vector and this vector are right angles. That means this angle is again 90 minus theta. What's this angle right up here? What's that angle going to be? Is it 90 minus theta? Is it theta? Is it something else? Theta. Theta. So you could go back to this original one, or it turns out these types of problems happen all the time. And if you get this situation where you have an inclined plane, every other angle should be theta. For example, right here, this is theta, this is 90 minus, this would be theta, right? 
this is 90 minus theta, this would be theta. And so we see every other angle, the dots here represent 90 minus thetas, the thetas represent theta. And so we see that in this type of coordinate system rotation issue, every other angle will be theta. All right, so that said, I'm gonna get rid of the ones that we don't need just to clarify this. Why did I choose these vectors to split up? N doesn't need to be split up because it matches the coordinate system, one axis of the coordinate system. MG does not match either two, that's why I split it up. F does not match either of these. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, how come this here you had to split up two vectors? Yeah, but over here, I don't have to split up the acceleration and that's worth it, trust me now, right? So here there's two vectors I don't need to split up and two vectors I do. No matter how you do this problem, there's gonna be two vectors you have to split up, but by choosing this, one of your force equations equals zero, and that's usually hugely advantageous when you're doing the algebra. So this is how I would label these. This is mg sine. This is mg cosine up here, this is F, that's the magnitude, times adjacent, cosine. Opposite, F. So I'm going to pause for a second. That's how you get the size of those components. Any questions? Sweet. Now, which components should be positive or negative in the x direction? Let's go to the x direction. For this problem, with this coordinate system, which ones are x components and positive? Go ahead, somebody tell me. Let's get this out of the way too. I tell you what, just tell me one component in this picture that's along the x-axis. Someone added to the chat an answer. Oh, sorry. I wasn't watching that. I didn't hear. Okay, mg sine theta. So Isaac, mg sine theta, is that one positive or negative? I'm watching the chat. Okay, good. So then that's perfect. So in this problem, we said down is positive. Very good. And that's what I was trying to check. And so then this one, f cos, would be negative. Good job. Then the rest of them, this would be positive, negative, negative. We're good to go. What do you think? Um, I'm going to pause for a second. Uh, I think, do you guys have a way to enter thumbs up or thumbs down? I think you do, but I don't know. Or just is, you could do the screen share if you are. Yeah, is this kind of helping some? Okay. Okay, good. Now, Really, what's really going to help you? Drawing these pictures, writing down the force equations, and then getting fast at the algebra. If you are good at this, most students really like this part of the class because they get used to it, they get fast at it, and generally speaking, you get good grades at it on test day if you practice. All right? So you can do this. Um, let's go look at the, the answer there. I appreciate the feedback. Um, So in this way, this case, you could see, how do I set up these problems? I don't do every problem perfectly, but a lot of them, I try to draw the coordinate system in, uh, sorry, the coordinate system in red with the acceleration. Now, are there other ways to do this? Yes. No matter how you choose this, you should get the same answer down here. You may have different work. You may have different steps. But regardless of the choice of coordinate system, everybody in the class should get the same answers. So if you chose a different coordinate system than me, you should have different algebra, but you could check if you get the same answer as me. I hope that part made sense. Okay. So there's that. Um, and let's see. Uh, okay. So you could see there's some procedure you follow, and I think we're good to go. Now, some tips I have here, all right? Just some comments. Um, 
a lot of times what students will do, and you can see I kind of did a bad job here. This angle looks a lot like 45 degrees. Generally speaking, if you're drawing your pictures, if you deliberately draw a skinny angle for theta, even if the picture doesn't look like it, I call this the tiny theta trick or a skinny angle trick. When you do this one, it usually becomes very obvious which angle is theta in the picture. This is a small angle, much smaller than 30 degrees. So this is probably theta, right? What if you have a horizontal force right here? If you look at it and split it up, you're like, hmm, theta is small. This is the small angle. It becomes obvious which angle theta is. So it's a visual check. I call this the tiny theta trick, all right? If you always, and now if you draw your angles at 45 degrees, it's not obvious at all because everything looks like a 45 degree, right? So if you're always drawing angles at 45 degrees like this, this is a bad strategy for succeeding because sometimes you'll flip sine and cosine accidentally in a rush and you won't be able to check it. By drawing skinny angles, it's easier to visually check if you didn't, if you flip the angles or not. Okay, so that's my tiny angle advice. All right, uh, a second thing I wanna mention, it's oftentimes very convenient to have your textbook ready for class. And in week six, we finished chapter six. So this is probably the time, if you haven't already done so, to order volume two of the workbook or go and make your plans to get volume two. If you do not have volume two of the workbook, now is the time to order it so you aren't sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for screen shares from me two weeks from now. Get workbook volume two now. All right. And then the last thing, we got 15 minutes. Let's see how you do on this question. All right. In this case, let's go to the workbook here. All these questions are really fun, by the way. I don't know. I, I, I really like this stuff. Oh, man, these are really cool. I, I just, I don't know. I, I get into this stuff. It's more fun now than projectiles. So I want to talk about, um, let's do this one here. Let's look at 5.20 at the bottom of page 89. Okay. So there's a three-stage event. The person is in flight. It makes contact with the ground, and then the person comes to rest. And you could visualize this uh, over here with these pictures on the uh, right side, these pictures right here. Okay, they're kind of showing you what happens. The person's falling down. This is when they first make contact. And then here at the bottom, when their legs are crouched here, their velocity is finally equal to zero. So to be clear, their velocity is downwards here, and at the second they make contact, they're still moving downwards. And that's why when you jump down, you end up in kind of a crouched position. So obviously in real life, the normal force could vary wildly here, but we're going to assume there's some average value. And if you don't believe me, I've got a video clip I'm gonna show you right after we do this problem and I'll show you an example of this, okay? Now, um, let's think about this, go ahead and try and think this through. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes, all right? Try not to look at the solutions right away, unless you have already answered all three parts. Take a second to think this through. All right? So I'll give you a couple of minutes here. And if you want, if you have questions, you could ask me in the chat. Um, you could send me a private message. You could chat to your friends in the class, send them a private chat, um, whatever you want. Just kind of think about this problem, all right? If you've already done it, 
You could do a different problem that's required and spend the next 10 minutes getting something done for your homework. That's cool with me. Okay, giving you another minute here. Fan cart videos, I gotta post those. Okay. All right, so I don't know if I gave you enough time and I'm sorry if I didn't. What do you think is happening here? Um, what do you think should be true here between stages two and three? Obviously between stages two and three, there's a normal force upwards on the person and then there's the weight of the person pulling them downwards. Which force should be larger? What do you think? Oh, I forgot to write the answers. Whatever. What, which force do you think is larger? Or are they the same? Or is it impossible to determine? What do you think? Anybody? Sorry, I wrote that. There's... So on, on stage two, the acceleration is going upwards, right? Because if so, how do, you know uh, that? how do you know that? Just kind of what's going on in your brain to know that? He's saying that between these two stages, there's an upwards acceleration. What makes you think that? Because you're going from a, a certain velocity and then you're hitting the ground. So therefore you're decelerating. So acceleration has to go the other way. Moving down and slowing. Agreed? He's, so this is what he's saying. If you're moving down and slowing, velocity is downwards, right? Because you're still moving downwards towards the crouched position, but your acceleration has to be the opposite way. That is what gave him this piece of information. Once you know that, which force is bigger? So, so N has to be bigger in order for acceleration to be going that way. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say on the third stage, they have to be equal because you've gotten to a point where your velocity is zero. Exactly. So now at this point, if velocity equals zero and you stay in that crouched position, so acceleration is zero, in this stage, then they have to be N equals mg. So notice, sometimes the normal force is not equal to mg. Very good. Or said another way, if we put a scale under here, the scale reading does not always match the weight of the person. When you jump on a scale, first you'll see a big spike in the scale reading, and then it will gradually equilibrate to your weight. All right, so somebody else, some, okay, those of you that had me for Physics 110, you can answer this silently in your mind, and if you screw it up, I'm going to be angry with you. But those of you who have not had me for class, Let's try and answer this one. So if you had me for class already, try not to hit unmute because I think you should know how to do this if you had me for class. Somebody, it's okay if you haven't had me for class to totally screw this one up, okay? Between stages two and three, I'm gonna say the weight of the person is the action. And what do I mean by that? You've probably heard of Newton's third law as being action, reaction, right? So let's say the action is the weight of the person the force associated with mg. What is the reaction force? And to do that, see if you can fill in the blanks in this sentence. So for the reaction force, it's okay to be wrong. Take, take a stab at it. Heck, if, if you had me for class, I won't even make fun of you. All right, take a chance. So um, let's give the people who weren't, who didn't have me for Physics 110 to give a shot first. 
What do you think the reaction is? The weight force is the action. What is the reaction? Go ahead and hit unmute and give it a shot. It's okay to totally fail. So I know you're out there. Somebody unmute and take a stab at it so we can watch the video and end class. Is it the earth exerts a normal force directed up on the person? The, uh, that is not it. And that's the most common thing that people want to say. And that's what I was hoping we could talk about. It's not that. Okay. And this is what's crazy about it. People want to say the normal force is equal and opposite. But we just said the normal force right now is larger than mg. So it's not equal and opposite. It is opposite, but it's not equal. That cannot be true. That's a good thought. It turns out that's wrong. It's the most common wrong answer. And students say that all the time. So watch out. So it's not that. What is it? Also, too, that uh, normal force and mg are on the same FBD, so they can't be Newton's third law. That's true. That's true. I was going to – I'm trying to – okay. All right. So here's the answer, right? Okay. So the person exerts a gravitational force dir directed upwards – on the earth. If the earth pulls you down, you pull the earth up. And students have trouble with that, but it's straight Newton's law. Okay, Newton's third law says if object one exerts a force on object two, right? Here's the planet, here's the person, right? Mg is pulling down on the person as they fall towards the entire planet. Well, that means the planet is pulled upwards towards the person with magnitude mg. If you don't like it, too bad. This is the truth. If you can't accept the truth, I can't help you. All right? You've got to accept this in your life because this is the facts of the matter. When you are pulled down towards the earth, you are pulling the earth upwards the same amount. Now, Remember, we know that the acceleration is equal to the force over the mass. The forces are the same, but the acceleration of the Earth is tiny because the mass is huge. If the Earth's mass is massive, the acceleration is so small we don't notice it. The force is still there, but we don't notice the Earth accelerating, all right? The most common misconception is normal force and mg are action-reaction pairs. This is not true. I'm going to put this out. Normal force and weight are never an action-reaction pair. Never. Never. Okay? So students are really bad at this. So I'm going to prove this to you with a video, but if you have not done this already, read page 88 and do the problems listed on page 89 so that you don't lose these easy points, okay? These questions are not about drawing the FBDs. It's just getting the force diagrams right. Now, if I could, all right, um, it's a huge misconception students have, and I really don't want you to have that problem. So let me see. Here is me dropping a medicine ball on a scale. And I just want to show you what a real-life problem looks like let me get this full screen here. That's the scale that I'm pointing at. And on the plot here, the, the vertical axis is force. So, oh my gosh, I'm having trouble annotating. So I'll show you the plot in just a second. Whoops. Oh my gosh. Come on now. All right. Give it a second. What's going on there? Cable's plugged in. Oh my gosh. Really? All right, well, I'll link these videos in the solution later. Oh, this is so not a fun way to end class. Man, let me get rid of this. Let me get rid of this. Oh, my gosh.
gosh, come on. All right, so I could show you what the, let's see if it does it when it's not full screen. Oh, there it goes. All right, so there we go. I'm gonna drop this here. Now notice the ball bounced. Did you see that? Now let me pause for a second. Make this full screen now. The idea here is this is the force. Okay, so I'm reading force in Newtons. Over here, it's kind of hard to read. This is time in seconds. And the idea here is this is when the ball is at rest. This is when the scale reading is about 27 Newtons. That's the weight of this ball. Notice kilograms is not a weight. It's a mass. So this ball is 27 Newtons when it's at rest. But notice when it first hits the scale, the scale reading is huge because it has to push upwards enough not just to hold the ball up, but to stop its motion. And then in this case, the ball actually bounces. It catches air. Look, the force goes to zero. Then it hits it again. The force reading is still larger than zero, or sorry, still larger than 27. It bounces a second time. Then eventually it still goes up above 27. And then finally it settles in at 27. So we see that the scale reading must not be equal to the weight when it's stopping it, all right? And then if I could, I know it's time to go, but okay, let me get out of here. Whoops, come on. There's another one here. Now it turns out it was very hard for me to jump on the scale. So what I did here is I did the same video, but in reverse. So, um, and it's gonna be me jumping off the scale. So in this case, I'm going to get into the crouched position. So it's exactly the opposite of the video we did. All right, I hit pause here. So now think to yourself, what should the scale reading look like when I jump off of the scale? I'm starting from the crouched position. I'm going to jump up in the air. Think what it should look like. <laughs> what massive hops. Clearly, I should have been in the NBA. All right. So what you could do here is I'm going to wait till I expand this. Give it just a second. Notice this is what it looks like when you jump off the scale. All right. So my weight is wiggling here because I'm kind of wiggling up and down. Right. And that's why the scale reading doesn't stay exactly at about, believe it or not, I'm about a thousand or 1100 Newtons. That's a lot of weight if you didn't realize that. So I'm a big dude. All right. So now right here is when I jump. Let me move this here. And then right here, I'm no longer touching the scale, so the scale reads zero. But we see that when I'm jumping, the scale has to produce much more uh, force upwards. Otherwise, I don't leave the scale or I don't leave the crouched position. So if you're going to jump up in the air, the scale reading, once again, does not equal mg. So the point of this was to cure you of this misconception that normal force and mg are action-reaction pairs. My weight in these videos is never changing. The weight of the medicine ball is never changing, but the normal force can read a totally different number. All right.